that's the end of our presentation. OK, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mahendra, do you have a question? Uh, Mahendra, I don't know if there's some technical glitch. Yeah, yeah sir. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. In uh, in this, uh, so many uh, new birds species discovered, but uh, we saw that uh, most of bird species reported from the Arunachal Pradesh. So, if this possible, or it is uh, mean by that is unexplored area of the Arunachal Pradesh or Northeast India. Hello. The, part, the participants are here. Other uh, and Ria. Yes, sir. Because uh, I think the two or three the birds. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there are two, three species reported. New species reported for Arunachal Pradesh. That is the part of the Himalayan region, or we said that the northeast regions. So it is possible that uh, the ex area are not uh, too much explored, or maybe required that uh, exploration is want to more in this area. Uh, so they are mostly unexplored uh, places, but it's also possibly because there are a lot of tribal, um, uh, there's a lot of tribal land and they're very conservative. So people like them, they know more about this. And I don't know if that's what you're asking. No, actually, maybe chances that a uh, government not uh, conducted such programs that are particular that reasons because when I go to actually I working in the Arunachal Pradesh when I go to a field area or any tribal area that there is nothing like the problem is happening with any persons they cooperate all these uh, things that they if we don't harm them that they all the uh, help helping to us field also so uh, it is maybe required that uh, uh, such programs will be organized in this area that be an uh, explore because people want to explore nearby areas most of time no so yes, yeah okay good your good job good work your uh, poster presentation actually very good nice uh, your photo sessions all these things content also good okay thank you Okay, Dr. Santosh and Dr. Mahendra, if you don't have any questions, uh, we will let in Shruti from second year CPZ to present because her name went missing in the name list, but she had submitted the abstract and uh, she has an emergency, she says. So we'll include Shruti now. Shruti, over to you. Uh, Shruti, is this requested that you finish within five minutes or maximum six minutes, no? Yeah, so, we'll, we'll I will check the timing. Five. Five. Yeah, that is better. Yes. Um, so Anurag, uh, do you have the? Did you receive the email? One second, I was actually ready with another uh, person. Sorry. No problems. Mahasi though. Yes. Oh, it is visible, right? Yes, it's visible. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about rosy starlings in India. So you've definitely heard this bird's name, I think, in almost every presentation that you've made. And that was actually from uh, Shruti, check your audio. We are not able to hear Shruti. Hello. Yeah. Shruti, can you hear me? Uh, others can hear Shruti speak, the chairpersons? No. OK. Uh, Shruti, you're not audible. Um, how about now, sir? I was using 
Yeah, yeah. Now I we can disconnect it. Proceed. We can hear you. Is my voice breaking or is it proper? There is disturbance, but uh, yeah, you can go ahead. We can hear what you're speaking. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, so um, I'll start from the beginning. So I was just saying that this bird, Rosie Starlings, you heard them in almost every presentation. And that was actually a main observation that I made through even my research online. That is that they are very versatile birds. So they're found in almost like every single type of ha like habitats. They can be found right from agricultural fields to like uh, sort of like desert areas to um, you know steppe and all of that. So they're really versatile species when it comes to habitat as well as uh, diet and everything else. So yeah. Um, so as you can see on the left side, it's the picture of a female rosy starling, and on the right side, it's the picture of a male rosy starling. So the fe I mean, they're called rosy starlings because they have the the uh, pink color uh, breast and mantle, but However, the females are not so rosy. They're more brown colored compared to the male, their male counterparts. Um, coming to the nutrition, they are very versatile and they have different feeding habits during different parts of their life cycle. So um, during the uh, breeding time, they feed more on insects and during the wintering time, they feed more on fruits. Um, so as you can see, the common insects which they feed on are beetles, locusts, grasshoppers, beetle larvae, and the common uh, fruits which they feed on are grapes, mulberries, figs, and jujubes. So, um, and when they are migrating, they take stopovers, and during the stopovers, they feed on nectar of flowers, like palash over here, which is men mm -hmm. mentioned. So then, uh, moving on to their... Um, like the length of the body. The length of the body is around 19 to 20 centimeters and the wingspan is 37 to 42 centimeters. The habitat, they, uh, as um, I've said, they are migrating birds. So they migrate from uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia to India. And their uh, breeding grounds are in Eastern Europe and Central Asia and their wintering grounds are in India. Most of the population is found in India through like for like a good part of the year. That is, you could say from uh, right from July to around March, April, it's uh, their uh, populations are found in India. So that's like the most part of the year. And this is a very important observation because it lies in the hands of Indian ornithologists to do more research on them and find out, you know, like the actual uh, extent of the knowledge about these birds. Um, now about the migration, the behavior, they're extremely gregarious, as in they're very crowd friendly and they travel always in huge groups and they feed in huge groups. And uh, this is a very characteristic thing about them. And because they are in such huge groups, they form what is called a murmuration. So murmurations are basically their different formations or like really beautiful swirling patterns in the sky which kind of look like beautiful clouds, like black clouds. And that is a very beautiful thing to observe when you see a lot of rosy starlings. They're long distance migrators and they migrate from west to east against the common north-south migration. So usually you can see uh, birds and animals moving from, uh, uh, migrating from north to south, but these are unique in the sense that they move from the east to the west. Sorry, from the west to the east. Yeah, that's it. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Okay, so if there's no questions, can we move on to the next? Uh... Yeah, next one. Okay. Yeah. Next yeah. one is Ashwant uh, with the vultures of India. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um. Ah, yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ishwan Goda, and the topic which I'm going to present today is on vultures of India. Uh, vultures are scavengers, and they feed on dead animals. There are 22 species of vulture found around the world, and nine species of vulture are found in India. 
the nine species sir uh, can you zoom, zoom on those uh, poster those such species Uh, yeah. okay. The nine species which are found in India are bearded vulture, griffon vulture, Egyptian vulture, red-headed vulture, slender-billed vulture, cinereus vulture, white-rumped vulture, Himalayan vulture, and Indian vulture. These all nine species, uh, species of vulture are found in India and belongs to family Acepitridae and order Acepitriform. Uh, talking about the number of vulture in India, the number of vulture of India is decreasing in at an alarming phase from 1990s because of uh, environmental contamination habitat loss exploitation etc another main uh, main reason for decrease in vulture species is using of anti inflammatory drug called diclofenac uh, how this diclofenac is in, uh, infecting the affecting the vulture species are when the uh, animals are subjected to this uh, diclofenac drug Uh, when they are dead, even after they are dead, the tissues will contain some amount of uh, diclofenac. When these vulture species feed on these uh, dead tissues, uh, they get exposed to this diclofenac. Uh, even the small amount of diclofenac will cause kidney failure and uh, visceral gout in vulture species. Uh, in India, uh, from 1990s, uh, 95 to 99 percent of uh, uh, gift species have been affected by this uh, diclofenac uh, contamination. And uh, the most affected species are Indian vultures, white red, uh, white thumped vulture, red headed vulture, and uh, slender bill vulture. Uh, important talking about the importance of vulture in our ecosystem. Uh, the scavenging of uh, lifestyle is very im much important in the to maintain the healthy ecosystem and avoid the spread of cont contagious disease. How these contagious diseases are uh, uh, reduced or can be uh, reduced by vultures are when they consume that they decay their dead organism they even consume those so this is causing microorganism as a vulture the stomach has a uh, extremely corrosive stomach a stomach acid is present with the vulture they kill all the microorganism when they consume so uh, the micro this is causing microorganisms can be eliminated from the ecosystem Uh, the importance of vulture is truly uh, felt when the decrease of, when they, when there was sudden decrease in vulture species uh, for example for example the feral dog species were uh, uh, the feral dog population were increased from 7 million to 29 million in india in 11 years from that the dog bite was increased and rabies causes uh, rabies cases were also increased by 50 cases in india so it is very important to uh, conserve and protect the vulture species even government has taken initiative uh, to uh, government has taken initiative initiative to protect and conserve the vulture species like uh, captive breeding programs uh, this captive breeding program which was first uh, that first captive breeding program was uh, introduced in uh, 2004 in pinjar haryana 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 state uh, they may they mainly concerned on uh, critically endangered species which are slender billed white rumped and red headed vulture and they were successful also uh, this pre this program uh, consumes some more amount of time even they uh, take decades to uh, do one pro one breeding program as vultures reach their maturity uh, when they are five years of old other pro other conservative program which uh, government has done is banning of diclofenac drug uh, by from this the uh, 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 vulture population was uh, able to increase now it is not now right now they are after they are banning it has we can see little improvement in vulture species uh, by the and uh, if we have a healthy vulture we will have a healthy ecosystem if we have a healthy ecosystem we will have a healthy livestock and if we if the livestock are healthy even we will be healthy and ecosystem will also be healthy so by saying this uh, 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 i am ending my presentation thank you so much that is my small presentation of vultures of india okay thank you uh, how widespread is the uh, diclofenac in i can understand it, cattle but what about uh, wild animals do you come across any information uh, diclofenac there painkillers uh, which are given for wild animal uh, which are given for livestock uh, where for cattle so even it we if, if if it may affect other wild animals also but i don't know about that but it affects vultures mean 
So the government has uh, declared another uh, alternative, uh, uh, meloxicam, other than uh, diclo. We can use meloxicam as painkillers and anti-inflammatory anti drugs uh, instead of diclofenac. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Beck. Okay, if there are no more questions, can we move on to the next one? Thank you, sir. Okay, Dr. Beck. Uh, good evening to one and all. We would be presenting on the topic of people's participation towards conservation in, of birds. Concern towards ecology and conservation of birds around the world has greatly increased in the recent past. This presentation highlights on people's participation towards conservation of birds. The methods followed to conserve the sparrows, hornbills, the painted stork, and the great Indian buster would be discussed. The summer is here too. This is the prime time to step in and conserve our fellow living beings. Talking about the great Indian buster project, the great Indian buster is categorized under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Despite this, it did not gain attention and remained below the protection line. The main reasons cited for its decline are habitat loss due to con conversion of grasslands to other purposes, anthropogenic and related biotic disturbances during its breeding season and frequent poaching of the species as a game bird. With an objective of protecting the remaining population of the critically endangered Great Indian Buster, locally called Godawan in Rajasthan, Project Great Indian Buster was launched by the Honorable Chief Minister Ashok Gehlot on 5th June 2013, that was World Environment Day. Western Rajasthan is a major Great Indian Buster habitat. However, this region has many power installations leading to electrocution of these birds. Following an order from the National Green Tribunal in December 2020, the Central Electricity Regulatory Authority issued specifications for bird diverters to be installed on transmission lines and suggested the existing power lines that endanger these birds to be shifted underground. There are about 120 to 150 great Indian busters remaining now, which is concentrated in the Desert National Park region. Shifting our focus down to the south now, Kokre Belur is another important conservational site, which is situated in Madhur village, Karnataka. The village is named after the painted stork, which is called Kokre in Kannada. The villagers have adopted this bird as their local heritage since they consider them as harbingers of good luck and prosperity to the village. The commercial benefits derived by the villagers from these birds include the phosphorus and potassium rich manure obtained from the bird droppings. Kokre Belur is not a reserved forest sanctuary, but is a small village where the storks and pelicans coexist freely, mostly in tamarind trees in the middle of the village in total harmony with the villagers. Consequently, reports indicate increased nestling activity in the recent years. Thus, efforts to conserve these birds have been fruitful and as hailed as a role model for other places in terms of conservation as well. Anisha would now take over Good evening. So coming to sparrow conservation, as we know, the house sparrows are tiny birds that can live in urban or rural habitats in close proximity with human dwellings. Compared to the American sparrows, they are chunkier, fuller in chest, with large rounded head and shorter tail. The main importance is that they feed on alpha and catworms, which are dangerous for crops and thus are a friends of farmers. So. There has been a gradual decline in the population due to change in infrastructure of buildings, pollution caused by uh, radio wave emission and pesticides. So RSKS is an organization that was founded in 1992 by a group of youth. They work in the conservation of sparrows. The main objective is to promote the uh, 2,500 eco-friendly bird nests for sparrow dwellings and they also arranged uh, seed and water for them. So there has uh, 
Okay. Also, the World Wildlife Fund is involved in providing custom-made nest boxes for sparrows in various states to encourage sparrow breeding. So, coming to the hornbill uh, conservation. So, as we know, hornbills are big birds with males larger than females, and they are easily recognized with long yellow beaks. They are monogamous birds with long breeding season, which involves intense parental care. They nest in large softwood trees with existing cavities. They can't make their own nest cavity. The hornbills have been declining due to felling of trees and, hunt and hunting. So the hornbill nest adoption program was adopted in 2011 with the partnership of with Cora Ape Society, which is a council of village leaders and forest department of Arunachal Pradesh. So uh, the native, the tribes of Arunachal Pradesh, the Nishi, help called as the nest protectors, help to protect uh, protect these hornbills. So they have been trained by the NGOs for finding nests, monitoring activities of birds, keeping a close watch on their nests, and see that they are unharmed by human activities. They are provided with salary and equipment. So during the non breeding season, they scout their area along the Pake River to calculate the species number of species of hornbills and the roots. So also, it allows opportunities to people to become hornbill parents as they can adopt hornbill at a cost of 6,000. Uh, the funds are collected are provided for salary. The hornbill parents also get report on hornbills. Also, the Pake pa uh, Pale Pake Festival is celebrated in Arunachal Pradesh to celebrate the role of uh, the Nishi community in the endeavor to protect the species. It also promotes um, uh, awareness activities of the culture and the wildlife of our natural Pradesh. So thus, conservation of these birds are really necessary because in the ecosystem, uh, they play a major role in the ecosystem. Without them, there will be ecological disrupt uh, uh, disruptions and will affect the uh, affect the other uh, the livelihood of other species like we can see that the sparrows they are considered the friends of farmers without these spar uh, without these sparrows there will be difficult in crop production and agricultural activities will be uh, can you uh, summarize anisha uh, uh, yes. can you yeah the time is over both of you Thank you for this wonderful you, presentation. Sir. Both of you have made an excellent contribution to uh, giving us understanding on the birds that are threatened. Dr. Santosh is uh, busy on an appointment. So uh, Mahindra, any uh, comments? Uh, yeah, the great one question is there. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, these uh, people mention only the uh, Pake Tiger uh, Reserve area. Actually, uh, Nisi tribes in the Arunachal Pradesh uh, that old uh, uses the hornbill of the beak of the hornbill, you know. So, all, not only the in Pake, you know, this is not right information. No? All the Arunachal Nisi communities using, previous using the hornbill beak. No? Correct. So, correct, yeah. Okay, this well, one probably... is, uh, yeah. All are good. Good. Yeah, probably oh, they have okay. referred one research article, uh, Parjita and all uh, report, no? Uh, yeah, Parjita is working on uh, all different types of the hornbill in the Arunachal Pradesh in the different region also. Correct, yeah. correct. Uh, I meet one time, uh, Parjita Dutta also, okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, we'll now move on to the last presenter in the session. Uh, Anurag, who is the next one? We have a brood uh, parasitism in uh, Indian birds. Gurman and Mukta, correct? Gurman is here or Mukta, one of them? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Here. yeah, yeah, please. Uh, girls, please stick to three minutes and they wind up. Yeah. Okay, so um, Anura, can you please share the uh, poster?
Um, good afternoon, one and all present here. As you can see, uh, we shall be presenting brood parasitism in Indian birds. So let us begin. Turns out that there are a lot of different birds that don't build a nest at all. They only lay their eggs in other birds' nests. This behavior is termed as brood parasitism. And the trick behind this is that they have to lay an egg which looks exactly like all the other eggs and should have the same size, shape, a harder shell and a shorter incubation period. This is known as uh, egg mimicry. If this does not occur, the mother bird will kick that egg out of the nest. But if the egg looks exactly like all the other eggs, she will have no other cho choice but to raise them as her own. So another trick is so, uh, um, this for a brood parasitism uh, to be successful is that the chick of the brood parasite will grow much faster than the chicks of the actual nest. It gets really big and its adaptation is to kick and it kicks the other eggs out of the nest. So now the statement, no one is born a murderer, comes into question. Um, and even if the other chicks hatch and survive, it is way bigger and its mouth is also much bigger. And when its mom comes to feed, she sees this giant target mouth of the brood parasite. So how exactly does this come into picture is when a female is ready to lay an egg, she swoops into the nest of a smaller bird species. There she adds one of her own eggs. And when the host returns, she suspects nothing at all and accepts the egg. For her, things are absolutely normal. Once the chick hatches, as stated earlier, it can push out all the other eggs for itself to claim all the food and space, thus eliminating all competition. And the way it tricks its foster parent into feeding it as much as it can shall be explained by my partner, Gurman. Now I hand it over to her. Uh, so what Mukta just spoke about uh, is termed as nestling mimicry. Nestling mimicry is basically the parasitic uh, offspring uh, the, uh, imitating certain behaviors of the host offspring. So these parasitic offspring use three strategies mainly to outcompete the host offspring. The first one being size. Uh, so the parasitic offspring are evidently larger than the host offspring in order to get the attention of the foster parent. Secondly, the vocalization, that is the begging call, is such that it is irresistible to the host parent. And lastly, the size of the mouth and its color is such that it is red or orange uh, to grab the attention away from the host offspring in order to be fed more by the foster parent. Now you must be wondering why the host put up with this behavior and don't do anything about it. It's simply because the host can't afford to take that risk. They are capable of misrecognizing their eggs and eject or damage them thinking it's the parasite's eggs. To counter this, uh, the hosts have come up with different uh, defensive uh, strategies to oppose their brood parasites. They usually look after their nests in pairs or groups uh, never leaving the eggs unattended. They often leave behind a helper bird when they go hunting and bring back food to feed that uh, helper bird. Uh, there are also instances where the hosts are seen attacking the brood parasite to shoo them away. Over to Mukta. So some of the examples of brood parasites in India, as you can see, on the poster is Pied Cuckoo, Common Hawk Cuckoo, Asian Coil, and they have their own specific hosts, which may include crows, babblers, and bulbuls, which serve as foster parents to uh, these parasite chicks. Uh, so now it's, I think it's clear that brood parasitism raises fascinating questions about coal evolution and conservation. I'd like to conclude by saying that undoubtedly in nature, energetics of breeding is very specifically regulated. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mahindra, any comments? No, good, uh, good presentation. Uh, all you. the presentation are very nice. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. We are coming to the end of this uh, second session on poster presentation. Uh, we just heard uh, the chairperson's comment. And uh, thank you all the presenters uh, of the second session. We now move on to the last and the final session. I'm sorry the time is a bit extended, but we have five to six presentations. We'll wind up with that. So thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to the third session. I request Dr. Sangeeta, the head of the Department of Zoology, Indian Academy Degree College, and Dr. Putul Banerjee, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, St. Joseph's College, to chair the final session. Uh, we have the raptors. I mean, uh, students are presenting raptors of India and other articles. Thank you. Over to the chairpersons to call out. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, madam. Yeah. Uh, we'll move quickly to the first presentation, Raptors of India by Ajay Vikram, Sirivant, and Syed. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you proceed? Am I audible? Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah, yes, yes, you're audible. Yes, you're audible. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. This is Zai Vikram from Second Year CZ. And my, uh, myself and my friend Steven will be presenting on uh, raptors of India. Raptors are also known as birds of prey, inclu uh, include species of birds that hunts and feeds on vertebrates. So they have keen eyesight, strong feet, uh, equipped with talons, and curved beaks. So the term raptor, it is derived from the Latin word, which means uh, rapio, uh, which means to seize or take by force. And uh, I'll be just giving a uh, brief, uh, brief talk on about habitat and hunting mechanism with the uh, role, role, role of uh, raptors in its ecosystems. So these uh, raptors, so raptors uh, basically includes eagles, ospreys, kites, true hawks, owls, vultures, buzzards, harriers, falcons, and carcasses. So I'll be speaking mainly on about vultures, hawks, owls, kites, and eagles. So that, uh, looking on to the habitats, vultures are found in open grasslands, cities, towns, and villages where, uh, where uh, there are more cultivations of food crops. And uh, hawks occupy every type of habitat from grassland and fields to the forest and wetlands. Owls usually are found in dense forests, but are also found in barren mountains, grasslands, and crowded cities. Kites and eagles are found in wetlands along the edges of rivers, lakes, and forests. And they are also uh, present where there is abundance of small animals like uh, rodents. Owls are nocturnal, are nocturnal birds, and others are diurnal birds. So looking on to this hunting mechanism, Raptors primarily use three tools mainly. So they are eyes, talons, and beaks. So eyes, uh, they, are, they are the first primary uh, organ used for hunting. Owl in owl, uh, and owl's eye account up to 3% of its entire body weight, which helps them to see clearly in the dark. Owl, owls have uh, binocular visions, whereas eagles and other raptors, they have monocular as well as binocular visions. So looking on to its talons, Raptors have powerful claws called talons. So they use the, they have three talons pointing forward and one talon pointing backward. So they are called as a raptorial, uh, raptorial foot arrangement. This type of arrangement is called as raptorial foot arrangement. And the back talon is, is also known as hallux, which is the larger than the other three, which helps them in uh, tearing the flesh. And the last one is, the, is its beak. So all raptors have the same type of beak, which is curved at the tip. And which, are, which allows things to tear the uh, tear and rip the flesh. So uh, other than these, speed is an important thing. Where uh, whereas uh, all raptors are capable of flying at high speed with a uh, peregrine falcon, it is topping the list with the with the speed of 390 kilometers per hour while diving. So looking on to its role in ecosystems, ra uh, raptors are the apex predators. So they play an important role in the ecosystem and are, and are also in the top of the food chain. In the biological uh, population, and they they also they also act as the controller of the small animals uh, and pests like uh, rodents. And also there are some scavengers like vultures, which helps in clean the ecosystems by picking the carcasses. And now uh, Shrivant will take over. Thank you, Arjun. I am Shrivant uh, from first year CBZ, and I'll be talking about three main uh, raptors and uh, their status, habitat. Threats and conservation methods. So the first one is red-headed vulture. 
scientific name is sar- sar- sarco- uh, sarcogypsum uh, cal- calvus its habitat is a uh, it is a predator which feeds uh, may on dead carcasses of large animals such as zebras birds and turtles and fishes its um, habitat is uh, uh, madhya pradesh karnataka uttarakhand and rajasthan its population is uh, ranging from 2500 to 9999 and the main threats are its uh, are due to the large scale uh, agriculture and other human encroachments and the individual mortality is high due to the ingestion of a highly toxic nsaid diclofenac which is a, a veterinary drug used to treat livestock and uh, its conservation methods are the government of india nepal and pakistan passed uh, legislation in 2006 banning the manufacture and import, importation of diclofenac as a veterinary drug with india passing further legislation in 2008 banning the manufacture sale distribution or use of the veterinary diclofenac the second raptor i will be talking about is the red neck falcon the and its scientific name is falco chichera its habit is that it's mostly it takes small birds caught on the wing and frequently hunt in pairs its habitat is these species are uh, uncommon it inhabits uh, grasslands in open country with low rainfall re- regions in india bangladesh myanmar and nepal from the sea level up to 1400 meters the indian population breeds during january to may the population is estimated to be in tens of thousands but the species is suspected to be undergoing a mod- moderately rapid population decline owing to ongoing habitat degradation the threats for these uh, raptors are the rapid urbanization development maybe the main causes of decline and for example around bangalore city there the population dwindled from five breeding pairs prior to mid 1990s to only sporadic recent sightings presumably due to the conservation of habit habitat within the within their ter- territories into densely packed bustling residential slash, slash built up areas conservation methods uh, which were carried out for these were uh, they ca- con- carry out regular surveys to monitor population trends conduct further research into the effects of changes in urban areas agricultural land and land management and they prevent the capture for trade in problem areas through law enforcement prosecution and awareness campaigns the third raptor which i will be talking about is the uh, forest howlet its scientific name is heteroglox the blevit blevitai its habit is a uh, it uh, often hunts during the daytime they feed on lizards small rodents amphibians and some invertebrates breeding occurs between october and march and its habitat it in habits dry deciduous forests of india mainly in maharashtra madhya pradesh and Ch- chatisgarh and gujarat at the heights of 200 to 700 meters its population ranges from 250 to 999 and are the number of mature individuals threats uh, uh, are the forest in its range is being lost and degraded by illegal tree cutting for firewood and timber and encroachment for uh, cultivation grazing and settlements are also another causes and um, other threats include uh, electric lines over grazing of cattle in forest areas conservation methods since its rediscovery in 1997 field work has been conducted to study its status ecology and threats intervention have been made to seek the prevention of further forest losses at the site of rediscovery over 100 individuals have been seen in the protected melgad tiger reserve of maharashtra and it has been recorded in other pro, uh, protected areas example uh, tornamal reserve forest and uh, kakna reserve forest and pune tanasa wildlife sanctuaries so, thank you yeah, the chair persons can proceed yeah. a uh, good explanation uh, ajay and sirivant on uh, raptors of india and especially on the conservation measures uh, i just have one question are they only uh, diurnal and nocturnal type of raptors or is there any other uh, habit like uh, other than diurnal and nocturnal ma'am uh, they are diurnal ma'am 
Okay, and, uh, and which uh, are the kind of practices you have observed in Bangalore? Ma'am, I have observed those normal kites and yeah. uh, uh, some bald eagles uh, here and there. Okay, ma'am, and uh, I could also include steppy eagles and uh, hawks. Okay. okay, thank you so much. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, uh, important bird areas of India by Dinesh. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Anurag, for uh, <clears throat> sharing the screen. Um, good evening, all. Myself is Dinesh. I am currently pursuing my master's in zoology from University of Mysore, Karnataka. And I'm also very happy and proud to say I'm the alumni of the St. Joseph's College, uh, CBZ batch 2016 and 19. I'm very happy to see all my teachers who have joined here again after a very long time. I thank uh, Dr. Jayshankar, sir, for giving me opportunity to present a general poster on important bird areas in India to conserve and relish the nature's elegant creatures. And first I would like to start and what are these IBAs called as important bird areas in India? These are the areas or the places of uh, international significance habitat wise in order to conserve and to protect the bird areas where the bird populations are seen very abundantly. And uh, they are usually recognized worldwide and it was this NGO called as BirdLife International who started this initiative in year uh, 1922. So far, they have been uh, recognized and maintained 13,000 uh, important bird areas throughout the globe in more than 200 countries. And uh, even India is a part of that. And what are these objectives of IBA? The main objectives of ID IBA is to safeguard the vital population of the bird, either it may be a single species, a group of species, or entire avian population. And these IBAs or important bird areas have been uh, recognized by the various standardized method and the standardized criteria, depending upon whether they're migratory birds or whether they're indigenous birds or um, based upon the type of habitat, based upon the threatened bird species, etc. And why do we need IBAs? IBAs do play a very important role in order to conserve the areas for the protection of the birds at the global level, regional level, and the sub-regional level. Coming to the Indian perspectives, India being the part of the IBA, the many IBAs are present in India around 563, and recently out of which 96 potential areas have been recognized. And uh, this BirdLife International, working with the Bombay, uh, working with the Bombay Natural History Society, and along with the many volunteer groups and organizations at uh, throughout the country, the bird watchers who are passionate about studying the birds have contributed in order to establish the IBS in India. Out of uh, 563, the 60% of IBS fall under the category of a uh, protected area such as uh, wildlife sanctuaries and uh, national parks, etc. And 40% of, uh, of them are present outside the protected areas. And now what is important is we have the well-established law, we have the well-protective groups, we have the volunteers who are working in order to safeguard the habitats of the birds and in order to conserve them not only at the present for the generations to come. But despite of this, we do see uh, certain threats when it comes to the bird areas or in common the any other uh, uh, animals for that uh, case. India being the highly biodiversified country at the top 17th level, we have the various habitats. We have the desert habitat, we have the grassland, marine, freshwater, terrestrial, various forest habitats, etc. And these are the home for thousands of the animal species. And one such species is also the birds. And though we have the many protective measures, but still we do see the threats when it comes to the birds, such as an habitat destruction is a very common. It might be because of an anthropogenic activities, uh, clearing of the forest for the various purposes, or it might be a natural causes such as a forest fire. And as a result of this, we are seeing the climate change. Uh, the weather is changing within the day several times. The abnormal climate change are also the another factors which are affecting the bird population and its habitat. And a lack of proper food, for example, the migratory birds which comes to India, and they do see the reduce in their food uh, availability, especially the mollusks, which are necessary to make up their strong shell when it comes to the laying of the eggs. And we also see the other illegal activities such as in hunting, uh, trapping the birds for their 
feathers for other byproducts and smuggling the birds between the countries is another threat which we see. And what you and me can do, coming to a conclusion, what me and you can do, uh, coming to a government organization or as a volunteers or as a students, what you and me can do is this. We can just protect their natural habitat of the birds. It doesn't mean we have to go to forest and we have to protect the forest or any other areas. Just protecting the trees in and around us, even the single tree which is present in our garden or in our campus acts as a habitat which supports the several species of the birds. So protecting the habitats is a very primary thing which you and me can do. And also we can educate the society how significant the birds are when it comes to sustain the ecosystem in order to sustain the food chain to make sure the food is available at the various tropic levels, the birds do play an important role. And also we have to amend the rules and regulation laws as and when needed, which favors the animals, which favors the bird and its habitats and the regular uh, visits at the ground level in order to collect the regular statistics in order to see the status, the health status of the birds in order to see their numbers plays an important role in order to protect the birds. Finally, I would like to end by saying this, by sharing and collaborating a knowledge and work, we can conserve these elegant creatures of the nature. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Uh, I request Dr. Putul uh, to share uh, her views. Uh, Dinesh, it was a very good presentation, and I am happy that uh, uh, happy to know that you are an alumnus of our college. I am a new you. faculty here. I liked your presentation a lot. I would not like to waste more time, and I would like to call upon the next uh, uh, presenter. Uh, it is uh, the birds in Hindu mythology by Lochana. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am uh, Lochna. Uh, my topic today is uh, the birds in Hindu mythology. Uh, in Hindu mythology, gods and goddesses have, are associated with either an animal or a bird. So birds are mentioned in great epics like Ramayana, Mahabharata, and even in Vedas. Children were taught about birds through stories from Panchatantra. Uh, it's nice to link science and mythology. So today I would like to talk about few birds mentioned in the Hindu mythology, uh, like the first one, uh, which is the common house crow. Uh, the crow, the scientific name of Corvus splendus, uh, is uh, is uh, the vehicle of Lord uh, Shani, which is planet Saturn, and it is also considered as ancestors uh, because of which uh, the food in Hindu houses are first kept to crows and then uh, consumed by uh, us. Uh, the next is common uh, crested serpent eagle. Uh, this is known as Garuda in the mythology and is the vehicle of Lord Vishnu. And it is known to have participated in uh, uh, Mahabharata war. Uh, next one is uh, brown wood owl. Uh, this is known to be the symbol of luck and wealth as it's uh, the vehicle of uh, goddess Lakshmi. And the next is Indian rose ring parakeet. Uh, this uh, is known to be the vehicle of Lord Kamadeva. And it's used as messenger among gods like uh, uh, called as Shuka in mythology. And it represents goddess Meenakshi and Andal. It is also used in predicting our future, like how future tellers uh, use parakeets to pull out a card and let us know our future. Uh, next one is a peacock, uh, which is uh, uh, is the vehicle of uh, Lord Subramanya. And even the feathers of uh, peacock is used like ornaments, like how Lord Krishna keeps it on his crown. Uh, next one is uh, Mute Swan, which is a uh, vehicle of Goddess Saraswati. And the last one is a uh, uh, white rumped vulture, uh, which is known as Jatayu in the mythology, and uh, which has, uh, which, which, where there are evidences to prove that uh, uh, the demon Ravana uh, uh, fought against demon Ravana to save Goddess uh, Saraswati. There are also other um, birds which uh, took part in mythology, but uh, there are no proper evidences, for example, pigeon and roaster. 
as uh, if you can please zoom the peacock picture like the picture next to the peacock uh, there's uh, a representation of roaster on the flag of lord subramanya and uh, there are many other evidences too but there are there, there are even um, mentions of two headed uh, birds but there is no names for uh, no names for us uh, to name it so i hope i could bridge birding and mythology and this would create more bird enthusiasts uh, i would like to end by saying that birds are not only brilliant indicators of the state of our nature but also a symbol of our culture thank you thank you lochna that you, was a uh... Uh, that was quite a offbeat topic uh, that you chose. So you mentioned Chattayu. I, I was just interested. Can you tell us which uh, family or which species uh, Chattayu belong to? And uh, can you also comment on uh, if the mythology, uh, mythological text, the species they mention, uh, they are uh, they 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 are actually. Uh, depicting some of the uh, extinct species uh, which were there and which are no longer uh, present today, which are no longer living. Uh, one, and yeah. Yeah, vulture is uh, that grips Bengal and says that white trumped vulture. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think few might have been extinct because. Uh, the many sculptures and even symbols on the coins uh, show uh, many headed birds like uh, the famous emblem of Mysore dynasty uh, and even uh, it has two headed birds which we have never seen uh, probably no, there uh, many headed birds i i would like to believe that they are a figment of imagination many headed because uh, but uh, yes uh, a vulture like bird because Jatayu description doesn't exactly uh, match with the vultures of today. So, probably it was a bird belonging to that family which got extinct and it is a part of our mythology as our collective memory, something like that. But yeah, I don't okay. think that many headed birds uh, would have existed sometime in our past. They, they may be a, a figment of our imagination. Over to Dr. Sangeeta. Uh, it was a very informative uh, presentation, Lochna. Thank you. Uh, Thank we'll you. move on to the next uh, presentation. Avian seed dispersal in the Western Ghats by Sachin. Um, before that, ma'am, can I say something? Yeah, yes, sure, please. go ahead. Um, Lochna, I, I would want to tell you that uh, uh, Garuda is actually a Brahminicite, and you can also see the clear uh, color patterns on the body. It, I don't think it's a crested serpent eagle, and people also call it Garuda, the Brahminicite. You can go check that out. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Sachin Baskar. And I'm going to talk about the avian seed dispersal seen in the Western Ghats. As we all know, there are many interactions. Uh, hello, am I audible, first of all? Yes, Sachin, please go ahead. Yeah, OK. So there are many interactions within the ecosystem that actually sustain the interconnected web of life. One among them is uh, the plant-animal interactions, out of which pollination and seed dispersal are uh, very good alike examples. So coming to the methods, uh, we uh, actually, uh, the survey was done for uh, uh, 82 co common and uncommon tree species in the mid elevation forests of the Western Ghats, situated in the KM, that is the Kalakad and Mundanturai uh, Tiger Reserve. And uh, uh, it we actually saw uh, one to four uh, phenological trails which were say one to five kilometer long and uh, many such surveys with respect to the fruji woes and uh, several other birds the the way they feed on the fruits and the and the way they disperse the fruit uh, the fruits and the seeds attached to it were studied and uh, many uh, nocturnal observations were also carried out to um, validate the 
uh, importance and their ability in dispersing seeds. Out of all the observations and results, uh, it was seen that uh, 17, 79% of the observed species produced uh, fleshy fruits and uh, out of them 59 species were uh, bird dispersed. And uh, another important correlation uh, that was found from this study was uh, there were a 30, there were a total family uh, count of uh, 32 tree species. That is, uh, 32 uh, tree species. I'm sorry, there were 32 families that were uh, seen of the 82 uh, tree species, and out of them, it was uh, seen that 22 tree families actually had. Uh, birds as their seed dispersers and the seed dispersal syndrome of such bird dispersed fruits are uh, usually purple to orange in coloration which directly correlates with the bird vision coloration and uh, apart from that dark fronted babblers and many species of green pigeons and uh, not to forget the two species of hornbills that are uh, widely seen in the western guards one being the malabar hornbill and malabar gray hornbill and the other being the great pied hornbill also act as uh, very good seed dispersers um, i would like to uh, conclude saying that uh, the reproductive ecology of many endemic species that we have in the western guards are almost undisclosed and uh, of course when you're talking about reproductive ecology of any flowering plant we cannot completely decouple pollination with seed dispersal both of them go hand in hand so uh, apart from that in spite of having such a rich biodiversity in the western guards there is very very limited amount of uh, data presented with respect to the end endemic species reproductive ecology and uh, no, almost no record exists in the western guards about the ichthyocori and sorocori which is actually lizards and snake seed dispersal respectively so i think this is a very uh, least studied topics i don't know the reason behind it but as far as it is concerned uh, first thing i should say that there are there are very limited amount of labs in india that actually work on the plant animal interactions and uh, second thing is as a researcher who should work on plant animal interaction you should be good in both plants as well as uh, animals again it is it is subject to your uh, study uh, so so the basic thing is uh, reproductive ecology of many western guard endemics are almost undisclosed so we have to study them as uh, researchers and ecologists so yeah thank you thank you sachin uh, it's a good work uh, I have only one question. Uh, are there any factors which affect the pattern of seed dispersal? Since you have... Uh, uh, yeah. the yes, yeah. so it depends. Uh, so in the forest type, uh, there are three type, one, uh, the, There are three ways in which the forest trails were led. One was the edge species, that is all the tree species that cover the edge of the forest. And the second one being the side species and the third one being the core central species. So we, we had a rapid increase in the seed dispersal rate at the, at the plants or rather at the trees that were there in the central region owing to where the birds are, you know, in high magnanimous congregations. That is how I infer the data. I hope I clarified your question. Thank you. Thank you. Well explained. Uh, Dr. Yes. Putul, you have any questions? Uh, no, Sachin, a very nice piece of work. And indeed, this is a topic which requires more attention from the research community, especially the co-evolution aspect of uh, animal-plant interaction. So all the best for your future. Nice piece. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to the next presentation, Birds as National and State Symbols by Ms. Ba. Hello? Yes. Hello? Am I yes, audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll be presenting a poster on birds as national and state symbols. Um, I'm a student of St. Joseph's College, Autonomous. So, India is known as 
you know, it's known to have a rich biodiversity. And in order to represent this diversity, uh, every state has adopted a symbol. Symbols like uh, state tree, state animal, state bird, so on and so forth. Um, starting with the Indian peafowl or peacock, which is infamously known as the National Bird of India. It was chosen so for its involvement in the Indian culture and tradition. Uh, the Indian roller bird uh, is the state bird of Karnataka, Odisha and Telangana. Some other birds include uh, the house sparrow for Bihar and New Delhi, the great hornbill for Arunachal Pradesh, Asian coral for uh, Jharkhand and Buducherry. The rest is uh, mentioned in the poster. Um, the criteria for the national bird, it is that um, the bird must be well distributed in the country. It is optional that it must belong exclusively to the country which it represents. Uh, a country often chooses an animal or a bird that would embody the traits that the country values and believes itself to possess. Also, it is preferable that the animal or bird has a part in a tradition, myth or folklore of the nation. And uh, the peacock pretty much fits the bill. Uh, now, when birds are discussed as symbols, we can expect them to appear on stamps. So uh, prior to independence, uh, the postal department of uh, the Indian Postal Department, they often issued stamps featuring the British heads and the rulers of British India. Uh, during that time, stamps related to uh, birds and other wildlife were completely absent. However, after independence, uh, the importance of wildlife was uh, felt and known, and uh, therefore the first bird to appear on the uh, on the Indian stamp was a postal carrier pigeon, issued in the year 1954. In 1966, on the eve of Children's Day, a stamp was issued again depicting a pigeon, uh, Columbia Livia, which was represented as an postal of uh, peace and harmony. And the first bird to appear on definitive stamps. Now these are stamps which are like, uh, they're a little dull to look at. Uh, they are though made in like um, several numerous in number. Uh, so these stamps, uh, they were the first bird to appear on such stamps was uh, the intermediate egret uh, issued in the year 1974. Um, in order to end the presentation, I'd uh, conclude that uh, it's not often that it, the India used India used to uh, produce stamps that of uh, that include endangered species, but um, the more they include, uh, it'll uh, like the more birds, uh, endangered birds that they include, it'll be uh, it'll spread the message to um, to conserve. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ba. Uh, thank you for the good explanation. Uh, Dr. Putul, you have any questions? I don't have any questions here. Ms. Ba, apart from generating interest, the symbols, do you think they will also give the birds some undue, atten undue attention in the way that they will attract some negative attention and uh, it can cause a little bit of harm to them? Uh, what is your view on that? Uh, I don't believe they would cause harm to birds. Um, yes, actually, see, uh, if birds are... For, pretty, for example, like, um, I tell you an example. There is a yeah. practice that you get peacock from Rajasthan and you populate them in some other places just because it's a national bird. So in your mm -hmm. view, is it good? In some ways it is, but it will also attract people who would poach them and uh, collect them as just for, uh, you know, like prized possessions. They might uh, keep them captured for long and they might collect their feathers and sell it because usually uh, they do poach um, some amount, like uh, some species of birds just so that they can collect their feathers and, uh, and then commercialize them basically. Yeah, you chose a very good topic and uh, it was a very good presentation. Good. Keep it up. Okay. Thank you, uh, ma'am. I, I think we can move on to our next uh, presentation. That is Sunbirds of India by Harshita and Shriyanshu. Good evening, all. Uh, myself, Harshita. Uh, I'm from CIFAR CZ. 
sunbirds of india sunbirds are placed into the taxonomic family nectarinidia which was so named because most of these birds feed on nectar the two species which i am the sorry the sunbirds there are of 145 species with uh, 16 genera and 12 of those species are found in india the two species which has used in the poster are cinereus astetius cinereus lotanus cinereus lotanus uh, lotanus sunbird uh, it is a female bird female birds are dull gray brown in color and pale yellow blue the purpose sun the purple sunbird which is cinereus astetius is a female is a male bird it have metallic hues under a good lightning else appear purplish black during breeding season uh, uh, distribution of sunbirds sunbirds range extends from the africa to the middle east and southeast asia to the southern china and new guinea to the no northern australia australia sunbirds are generally not found on oceanic islands in india the species are distributed in east of the desert region and south of the himalayas extending to the west and south of india sunbirds especially adults not only on forests but also on urban gardens behavior of sunbirds are sunbirds are colorful pollinators of many plants they are tiny birds with a curved beaks with which they suck honey from flowers they are attracted by himalaya patterns are also called as fire bush this also eat insects and spiders to get minerals and vitamins in order to woo the females the male flutter their wings and sings the bond between the female and male is strong and males do assist in feeding chicks but the female as only they incubated the eggs thank you I, I would like to speak on the conservation of sunbirds and uh, the threats they are faced. So according to IUCN, sunbirds are uh, uh, mentioned as yeast concerns so, and uh, seven species of sunbirds are threatened with extinction. Uh, and the elegant sunbird is endangered, uh, which is Aethopyga duivendbodei. And uh, the main threats to sunbirds are uh, habitat loss, degradation of habitat, deforestation, and human encroachment. The scarlet chest sunbird is uh, considered as an agricultural pest because it spreads parasitic mosquito on uh, coca plantations. So farmers tend to uh, kill the sunbirds or trap them and uh, kill them. And uh, although sun sunbirds are uh, beautiful because of their metallic colors, they're not typically captured for pet trade because of uh, their hard to uh, I mean, they require high maintenance and because of the nutritional needs. Thank you. Chairpersons will directly go to the last presenter. Yeah, we'll uh, move on to the last presenter. Uh, Hornbills of India by Devika, Vimitra and Sunaina. Uh, sir, they have not uh, shared the presentation with me, so I'm assuming they would do it on their own. That's so, Vimitra. Yeah, uh, Vimitra, you're going to present? Uh, no, sir, I've raised my hand. 19CB2026. Yeah, you're 26, correct? So, yes, sir. I'll I'm make ready. you the presenter. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you can proceed. I've made you present. Is it visible? Yes, yes. Yes, please go ahead. Will you start? Sir, I did start. Hello? Speak. 
speaking it is not audible whoever spoke but number 26 it was audible please proceed very feeble vimitra your audio is very feeble we can't hear it uh, now yeah proceed yes sir good, good evening everyone i am vimitra now i and my friend devikant sinana from second cebz of st joseph college are going to present our posters on hornbills of india hornbills also known as farmers of the forest play a vital role in the dispersion of hundreds of fruit tree species they are characterized by their bright and unique beaks they are majorly found in the indian subcontinent and southeast asia they belong to the fam uh, family of uh, becerotidae now we we'll look at the basic general characteristics uh, they are famous for their huge flattened and curved bills with toothed edges and bony helmets over the upper jaw as seen in the image uh, these bills are made of spongy tissues making them relatively lighter yet the first two vertebrae fuse together to form stronger neck to support it these birds smear the secretion of uropigial or the preen gland on their bills giving them the bright coloring they are in solitary that is they live as families or in groups of families every hornbill has its unique call and they are the only birds with eyelashes some are insectivorous and many are frugivorous they have an average life span of 50 years now sunaina is going to continue okay um so as per our topic india's hornbills we have about nine species of hornbills in the indian subcontinent uh, let's look into each one of them firstly we have the great indian hornbill which is the largest hornbill and uh, apart from their size they have uh, these majestic colors which make them more prone to hunting secondly we have uh, malabar pied hornbill they are usually found near human settlements and their habitats include moist and dense forests next we have indian grey hornbill this is the most uh, commonly spotted or distributed uh, species and uh, it is seen in dense forests as well as urban places and unlike other species they live in tree hollows then we have uh, malabar grey hornbill uh, these are endemic to the western ghats uh, meaning that they are restricted to that area alone what makes them different uh, from other species is that uh, they lack the cask uh, which is prominent in other species uh, the cask is a subtle ridge um, along the top of the bill Uh, which forms a large bulky structure next we have the oriental pied hornbill which is very much similar to the malabar pied uh, hornbill and uh, they are also predominantly frugivorous then we have the fru uh, rufous necked um, hornbill they are found in the northeastern part of india uh, less than 10 10000 species are left and the main reason being hunting uh, next we have the red um, hornbill they are also found in the northeastern part of india and the uh, buxa tiger reserve in west bengal is one of the best place to spot them uh, then we have the austin's brown hornbill uh, which is also um, found in the northeastern part of india uh, namdafa national park of arunachal pradesh is the best uh, spot to uh, find them lastly we have the narkoda uh, hornbill species which is uh, endemic to the um, island of narkoda in andaman thank you over to devika uh try to am finish I, it devika yes, as possible am i yes, audible proceed 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 yes sir are we speaking about the breeding pattern and behavior of hornbills hornbills are very vocal during the breeding season which lies between january to april the male bird initiates the mating call to which the uh, female responds and later on they call out in unison Uh, the male brings food to the female bird over several months to prove that he is a worthy mate and will woo the female with his colorful cask these birds consider long old tree cavities as safe nesting spots the female covers the tree cavity using mud fruits and her fecal matter leaving open a narrow slit for the exchange of food the nest consists of one or two eggs which is incubated for about 38 to 40 days While well, nesting, communication among the pair happens by flapping their wings on the nest. The female lays, hatches the eggs, and nourishes her chicks while staying inside the tree cavity throughout. Whereas the male brings food for the rest of the family until the chicks are able to look after themselves. 
Once the female emerges from the nest to help her mate in bringing food for their chicks, the chicks seal the nest again. The young birds have no trace of a cask. It takes about five years to exhibit complete development. These birds use the same nesting spot for several years. Hornbill pairs are very faithful and mate for life. Speaking about the importance of hornbills in tribal communities, the beaks and heads of hornbills are used in traditional charms and the flesh is believed to be medicinal by many tribes. Young hornbills are considered a delicacy and thus are under the threat of being hunted down for meat. Many tribes use hornbill feathers while performing important cultural rituals and programs. NGOs have come up with the idea of providing tribes with artificial hornbill casks and feathers so as to conserve the real ones. According to the IUCN Red List, hornbills are rated as near threatened, which means that they are threatened with extinction in near future. That brings us to the end of our poster presentation. Thank you. Thank you, presenters. Uh, I have uh, two questions for you. Out of the nine species, how many species are seen in South India? Four of Good. And uh, do the hornbills stick this to, to the same nest or they change over the years? Do they change their nest? Uh, no, ma'am. They usually prefer having the same nest, but in uh, due to like human intervention, uh, their nests are being destroyed, so they are used to looking for new nests. They're forced to do it. Well explained. Good. Thank you. Thank yeah, with you, that, man. we come to the end of uh, poster presentations for the day. Um, I request uh, both the uh, chairpersons to bear, us, bear with us and also chair one more oral presentation of Dr. Binu. She missed out. She's ready now. Dr. Binu, can you unmute and speak? Let's see if the network is OK. Uh, madam, you've got to unmute and speak. If not, uh, we'll have to wind up the session. We have already extended time. Kindly consider that. I don't think it's happening, so I, I thank have the both. presentation ready, sir, in case. Yeah, but uh, I'm not getting to hear, so we can't wait. We are already extended uh, this process. I'm really sorry for that, Dr. Benu. And we have come to the end of uh, today's uh, one day national level virtual conference on diversity and distribution of Indian birds. Uh, I thank the doctor and uh, Dr. Abdul for chairing the last session. Uh, now it's time for the final vote of thanks. Uh, I, you can unmute somebody. Yes. Mute. Okay, the vote of the thanks, the final uh, round. Um, first, I would like to place on record the support and encouragement provided by the management of St. Joseph's College, especially the principal. Excuse me, sir. It is uh, Dr. Binu who is unmuted. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is ready, sir. Okay, Anurag, share. We'll go ahead. Sorry, sir. Sorry for the inconvenience. So my topic okay. is cooperation evidence. Of... Oh. Okay, sir. And yeah. my topic I is cooperation uh, evidence. Of yes. Okay. Cattle grid bubulka sebe is, is a common as bird species seen in Kerala, and my study areas were uh, totally I selected five study areas, and my major findings. Were result, going to result and discussion, major findings were the abundance of cattle created during the period of 2017 to 19 seen observed to be highly deviated. That is uh, during uh, a heavy monsoon period here, which is uh, starting from June to September, uh, the uh, uh, abundance of is seen to be zero or whether uh, or otherwise it is uh, average is one 
during October to January, it is seen observed to be a plus or minus 11. And during February to May, that is during heavy summer period, the abundance of cattle is observed to be high, that is uh, uh, plus or minus 19 and also plus or minus 20. And overall, plus or minus 19 average abundance is seen here. Uh, the uh, conclusion of my study is that the cattle grid uh, showing um, short kind of migration, breeding migration from here, from Kerala to uh, near nearby states like Karnataka and Tamil Nadu for breeding purpose. Thereafter, their uh, abundance is very declined here. After that, uh, during uh, January itself, uh, their abundance again seemed to be observed to be high and it reaches again peak during May. So uh, the, this, this uh, photograph showing the abundance, the relationship of cattle and uh, among with the cattle aggregates, and this is the breeding plumage of cattle aggregates. Uh, so that is my uh, findings and my conclusion. So thank you, sir. Give me a chance. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benu. It's your perseverance that kept you connected, uh, though it was the last presentation. Uh, what has to happen? Well, Thank you, all the presenters. As I said, we are into the uh, last leg of today's uh, conference. OK. So I thank the management for their support, the principal, Reverend Father Victor Lobo, for his encouragement and support to we the department and the National Science Association in organizing various competitions and events. I place on record the thanks and gratitude to both the speakers, Dr. Raju Kasambe, who delivered the keynote address, and Dr. Abraham Burgis, uh, the invited talk. Also, Mr. Uh, Lawrence uh, for sharing his birding experience. I thank all the participants from different parts of the country for having actively participated and presented oral and poster papers of their findings. Thank you all once again. Uh, I'm thankful to my colleagues and my HOD in the Department of Zoology, St. Joseph's College. Uh, they have been a pillar of support and encouragement for the National Science Association in conducting and organizing various events like the one you just saw today. So thanks to Professor Thomas Fizakeria, our head of the department for his support and encouragement. Uh, all the NSA volunteers, the president, uh, Mr. Balaji, and uh, all the other office bearers, thank you for all your uh, support uh, in uh, the smooth conduct of these uh, proceedings. We launched the Joseph Fight uh, Forum for Birders, hope this remains active and will take off like an active bird with more and more volunteers and participation. Uh, I must also place on record the contribution of uh, the student organizers whose photos you can see here, Sumant, Rohan Sharma, Rohan Baishya, and Anurag for their uh, support in starting from scratch, uh, preparing every content material to the smooth conduct of the uh, webinar, the national conference today. Thank you all once again. Uh, stay home, stay safe. Hope this too shall pass off soon and we will bounce back to normalcy. Uh, we submit our prayers to the Almighty. Thank you. With this, we come to the end of the national conference. Thank you all. Bye bye. Am I